Um, I don't know that much about you, so it would be great if you could um, kind of introduce yourself as a class. You're ninth grade, right? Yeah. yeah. Ninth and eleventh grade. Ninth and eleventh. Cool. So, uh, what are some of the things that you usually do online? Like when you open up the computer and go to the internet, or is, what are some of the things that you do? Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> yeah, of course. What else? YouTube. 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 Definitely. Um, what else? Twitter. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Oh, some of you on Twitter. That's pretty cool. I don't have that many friends on Twitter, actually. So when you post on Twitter, do you usually like retweet stuff or you come up with your own? Both. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I know some people who are on Twitter like just so they can follow Justin Bieber or Lady Gaga or their favorite celebrities and they never post anything. So it's cool that you guys are actually uh, doing something on Twitter. Anything else? So we have Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. What? School websites. School websites. Okay, I love how there's Twitter, there's YouTube, there's Facebook, and then there's school websites. Just <laughs> pushed off to the side, last thing you think about. Well, today we're not going to be talking um, a tremendous amount about uh, researching, but it will be a little bit. So thinking of the school websites that you use, how you evaluate information, so when you're doing a Google search and you're looking down at the results and you decide what to click on, do you just click on something because it's first? Or do you look at, say, the name of the website and stuff like that? First. Whatever's first. Okay, so um, today we're going to be looking at some things that will help you evaluate websites when you click on them a little bit beyond what their search ranking is, which can be useful. Oh, and uh, before I forget, I should also introduce myself. Um, have you guys watched my TED Talk? Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. So you already know a bit about me. Um, I published a book, Flying Fingers and Dancing Fingers, um, and now I can do competitive speaking. So you saw my TED Talk, and I've been going to other conferences. That was two years ago. I'm 14 now, so I've grown a little bit, um, and hopefully I've gotten wiser. Although I still manage to keep in touch with my childish side. So, digital citizenship. Uh, what do you think digital citizenship means? What would be your definition of digital citizenship? <laughs> well, why don't we take it to the word citizen? When you hear someone say, being a good citizen, what, what sort of activities does that make you think of? Or what do you think a good citizen is? Charity, being part of the community. Good person, charitable in the community. Great. So if you know what a good citizen is, you can just kind of take those things and apply them to digital citizenship. So all the things that make you a good citizen can also make you a good digital citizen and just some added netiquette as well. So being a good citizen means that you probably wouldn't be nasty to other people and putting down your community and stuff like that, so you wouldn't do that online. It's basically the same as that. So the average American spends nearly a third of his or her leisure time online, that's a statistic that I found, and that's not counting the time that you spend online while you're at work or at school. So whatever you put out on the internet uh, can be seen by not just your friends, but probably also your mom. Um, some principals are even getting online, and the police are online, and apparently there are Russian gangsters online as well. So pretty much everyone's online, not just your friends, but uh, also lots of different kinds of people. So how many of you are friends with one or both of your parents on Facebook? Anyone friends with their parents on Facebook, right? Maybe that was a condition for you being allowed to be on Facebook. Um, I know that my mom and my sister have gotten into a lot of drama about, you beauty friended me again, you're putting me on a list, why am I not seeing your updates, stuff like that. And it's gone back and forth. So have any of you ever gotten into drama about your parents seeing something on Facebook? <laughs> you are such amazingly good students and children that I'm in awe of you. There, you might have heard of the story of the girl who posted something mean about her dad on Facebook, I guess, and then her dad really, really got angry and shot the laptop. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's been circling quite a bit. So it goes to show that while your parents may not be quite gun-wielding, really, really angry Facebook newsfeed readers, they are keeping an eye on you, which is a good thing. But it also means that what you post on Facebook needs to be something that you would be okay with your parents seeing, with maybe uh, people who know you like teachers and principals seeing, 
creepy people seeing, with Russian gangsters seeing, the guy who will be interviewing you for a job in 10 years seeing, and maybe even for your future husband or wife, uh, appropriate right after Valentine's Day. So the things that you guys post on your Facebook walls, how many of you think over the course of when you first got your Facebook to now, have posted at least one thing that you probably wouldn't want one of these people seeing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think pretty much yeah. everyone has. If you haven't, then you probably essentially have never ever posted anything on Facebook because we've all, um, if you post every day and you've had Facebook for several years, you've posted hundreds and hundreds of things. So I just got timeline and scrolling down my timeline, I'm starting to delete things and realizing, my goodness, I was really stupid <laughs> to say some, some of these things. Some things were just mundane and other things were like, wow, why did I post that? So think before you post. And that's pretty common sense. You just want to make sure that they'll be seeing this, you know, happy, pleasant things rather than this. I don't know what I was doing or what kind of face I was making in this picture and whose hat that is, but I don't think I want a future job interviewer to be seeing that as my profile. So who you are online is really just as important as who you are in person. A lot of people think that, well, the computer is kind of like a wall, that whoever's on the other side who's looking at my profile, I don't see them, they really don't see me, but the truth is that when somebody looks at who you are online, it reflects on who you are as a person. So, you are a digital citizen and everything you do leaves a digital footprint, it's really up to you to make sure that footprint is a clean one or something that you want other people to see. Even if you remove something from the web, it might still exist on someone else's computer. So if you take, for instance, that weird photo of me, somebody could have downloaded it onto their computer, why, I don't know, but it's possible. Or maybe tagged someone else in it, forwarded it to people, it could definitely have circulated. So how do you use the web as this awesome social academic tool that it is without putting yourself in danger or ruining your reputation? What are some of the tools that you use? when you're using the web. Okay, so when you're, when you're going to Facebook, you probably don't have this question running through your mind, hmm, I'm on Facebook, so the question is, how do I use the web without ruining my reputation? But now that you um, kind of see the importance of this, and in 10 years, let's say you're thinking, okay, people are going to be looking at my Facebook wall in 10 years, or at my Twitter in 10 years, or my blog in 10 years. What are some of the things you might do? <laughs> think what you're about to post. You think about what you're about to post, yeah. You might clean up some of the stuff that you posted before. Okay. Um, one of my Facebook friends often posts really witty statuses, but occasionally um, it'll have like profanity or something. And so he said, I'm about to go into a job interview. Now, task, must clean up Facebook. Uh, for swear words, so it was like delete, delete, delete. Um, but even that can be uh, kind of hard to do because, again, people might have copied it, people might have quoted him and on their profile or something like that. So you can definitely do cleanup work, but it's best to take that preventive attitude and not post things you'll regret in a few years. How do you know what's safe and what's not? So for you guys, has the fact that um, like privacy concerns, has that ever been concerning to you? Yeah. 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 So, what are some of the privacy concerns you've had, like with Facebook, Twitter, blogs? People just seeing everything? People seeing everything. Yeah, that's definitely a big problem. Um, another thing is that the companies themselves, because they have a lot of information, have any of you seen the personalized ads? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, personalized ads, and sometimes that can creep you out a little bit, thinking, wow, Facebook knows quite a lot about me, and is using this to essentially try to sell me stuff, or the companies that are doing the advertising are doing that. So, making sure to guard your own privacy is super important, and you've probably heard that before. A rule of thumb with people on Facebook is if you don't know them in real life, don't make friends with him or her on the web, because it's just too easy to hide behind that fake facade on Facebook. I mean, it's super easy for me to just go and create an account and I can say that I go to your school and look completely harmless. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. 
Think before you share or give out your personal information, anything like your real name, definitely your address, but even your email address, your telephone, all that sort of thing. And read privacy statements before sharing your info. Now, how long are privacy statements usually? Really long. Really, really long, and they're super, super tiny. So yeah, you don't have to like look at every single word, but it can be important if to parse the essential details. So like if there's anything saying, um, you know, we'll hold on to your pictures on our own remote server and they will be here and cataloged for viewers in the next 10 years, something like that. Did you know that the Library of Congress is doing something that will archive every tweet? Have any of you heard oh. of that progress, uh, project? So, and actually there have been a lot of jokes about it, saying, you know, the Library of Congress is really going downhill if they're going to catalog the tweets of Kim Kardashian and Paris Hilton instead of focusing on great books, but it's actually something that has really important privacy implications, because suddenly things that are posted on Twitter that get retweeted can become not just your or my private thing, it can be something that our future great-great-grandchildren will read in the Library of Congress, which is pretty interesting to think about. I'm not entirely sure if everything that I've tweeted I want to end up in the Library of Congress. So read the fine print, and tell a trusted adult if someone online is making you uncomfortable. I know it can be a bit, you might feel a bit weird about bringing this up, but it's really important. Now, after my TED Talk, a lot of people friended me on Facebook. I actually got like hundreds of friend requests and a lot of them were from people that I didn't know or had never heard of. And at first, I actually accepted a lot of friend requests because I was like, oh, they're just fans. But then there were a few people who would be, well, I wouldn't quite say stalking, that's putting it a little far, but who would just read every single post, like every single post, comment on every single post, would, would basically follow what I was doing with a stalker-like, um, I guess, passion, which is, which was a li which really weirded me out. I was, um, you know, 13, and so this was not something that I really wanted. So I've had a few run-ins with people where I've seen directly why you shouldn't be friending people uh, that you don't know and how people can really make you uncomfortable. Don't post your phone number or home address on your blog or profile. Pretty common sense, and it's just um, anything that can be used to identify you. So even if you post something fairly innocuous, you might think, like, let's say your email address. If someone Googled your email address, then they could probably find your name, because you might have put your name along with your email address somewhere else. And if you follow these basic safety rules and learn how to spot tricksters, the web can provide amazing photographs, source documents like journal entries and letters, treasure troves of accurate information. So what are some of the resources online? So when you have a school project, where do you go? What are the sites that you trust? Um, Wikipedia. Wikipedia. <laughs> I love how that's the first site that you trust. Here's the thing with Wikipedia is that, and you've probably heard this from your teachers, is that everyone can edit it. Now, that doesn't necessarily make it an un a really untrustworthy source. The thing with Wikipedia is just that um, because it has the potential for editing by so many people that, yeah, somebody could edit a Wikipedia article and insert something that was false. Why do you think someone might want to insert something that was false? Mess with you. Mess with your head. To mess with you. That's, one, that's definitely one possibility. Some hackers just do that for fun. But what's another possibility? There could be bias. They might want you to think one way and not another. So let's say there's an article about someone who's pretty controversial, like uh, or a political figure, Barack Obama, let's take for example. If a group of people who are really, really, uh, who really didn't like the Wikipedia article on Barack Obama and thought that it didn't say enough about, I don't know, what's something bad from Barack Obama's past? Um, okay, like how he um, smoked or something like that. If they thought it didn't have enough, then they would suddenly put in this giant paragraph about Barack Obama and how bad his smoking habit is and like put it right in the middle of the Wikipedia article. Now that's not necessarily false, but what it does is it creates a sort of bias. Uh, anyone know what bias means? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know what bias means. So people might edit Wikipedia articles and insert information that's either false or misleading or takes up too much space for its relative importance and that would create bias. So. 
yeah, the thing with Wikipedia is just to remember, okay, I'm looking at something that can be edited by me, it could be edited by my teacher, but could also be edited by someone who has an agenda. With that said, Wikipedia can provide, uh, I would say don't cite Wikipedia directly. Wikipedia is a great place to go as sort of a launching pad if you're looking for some really general information. It's like an encyclopedia. You don't cite an encyclopedia like when you're making a bibliography, you would go find the secondary sources. Um, so does anyone know what an encyclopedia is called? So we have the primary sources. Uh, those are things like journals or a recorded telephone call between the president and an advisor, that would be like a primary source. A secondary source would be a book written on the topic by someone who didn't actually you know, live through it. What would we call an encyclopedia? Not quite. An encyclopedia is actually something called a tertiary source. So kind of like first, second, third, um, which is why you often don't um, cite information from encyclopedias directly in like a research paper because tertiary sources are ones that are edited by multiple people that um, are usually more general, whereas secondary sources can be more specific. So those are that's something to remember when you're on the web. Even though they're not hardcover books, you can still say, okay, is this website providing a primary, a secondary, or a tertiary source? So Wikipedia would be a tertiary source. What's a website where you could find some primary sources? Something. Great, yeah, if you went to a dot .gov site, you could probably find a lot of primary resources. Like, for instance, if you were writing a research paper about um, the president's foreign policy, and you found a memo from uh, an Obama cabinet advisor on foreign policy, yeah, that would be a great um, primary source. Another place, another great place, have you ever been to the National Archives website? Well, the National Archives website is awesome because the National Archives houses um, archives of things like photographs and uh, testimonies written, all, really all sorts of stuff. So you can find awesome photographs, journals, everything. So that would be an awesome place for primary sources. And then secondary sources. Where would you go for secondary sources? So things written by experts on your topic. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me turn up the volume a bit too, because I heard. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. You guys didn't say anything. I just heard mumbling. Like, no, that's actually my secret way to pressure you into saying something. Um, no. Great places for secondary sources could be History.com or PBS. Anything that you know is trustworthy and reliable. The thing that happens when you just search something, uh, like let's say you search Martin Luther King. I'm hoping that Google doesn't solve this problem, but if you search Martin Luther King, one of the results was a website about Martin Luther King that was actually created by a white supremacist group called Stormfront, and so it had a lot of really blatantly misleading information about Dr. King, which was obviously not cool because then there are these third graders who are doing their little reports on Martin Luther King right before Martin Luther King Day and stuff like that, and they're seeing this information that isn't true and that's very misleading. So, Beware of just clicking on something because it's the top result. And if something doesn't look right, make sure to find the errors. And if there's a lot of errors in a website, you realize that it might compromise how good the website is overall. Websites created by organizations or people that are unfamiliar, you are questionable. So if you think that the organization behind a website is really fishy, that's something to, to be aware of. And just as some people create hoax profiles for nefarious purposes, so maybe some of your friends have created a hoax profile before, just for fun on Facebook. Well, people can create hoax websites too, and they can actually get really popular. So let's take a look at one. Uh, okay, I'll just type this in, or maybe I'll just copy it. Have any of you ever been to the uh, Boilerplate robot website? No. no. <laughs> it's actually um, a pretty cool website. Or I should say robot exactly. It's um. So it says boilerplate as soldier. Let me zoom in a bit. The mechanical man participated in most of the conflicts of its age, either as an observer or as combatant. So it was watching or spying. So this is 
boilerplate, the mechanical man, and you can see he's made out of metal and he has his little gun that looks like a gas mask almost. So apparently in 1898 he was in the Spanish-American War. Look, there he is with Teddy Roosevelt. Pretty awesome <laughs> photo op right there. Um, and here he is in 1904, the Japanese-Russian War. And there he is surrounded by a group of soldiers. 1916, the punitive expedition against Pancho Villa. There he is with Pancho Villa. And 1918, World War I, look at him. So uh, here are all these hand-colored photographs of him with the soldiers. And so, yeah. Now, you're laughing because you know that this isn't real, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, does the website look like something that somebody could probably, if they um, hadn't been warned it was a hoax website beforehand, could maybe think, huh, this is really interesting, this looks real? Yeah. Yeah, probably so. I mean, it looks like a pretty legit website. And, and I mean, he's with Teddy Roosevelt. How fake, I mean, how could you fake that? Well, yeah, you could totally do Photoshop and make it look grainy and old. But the point is that some people create these hoax websites, it's fun, and we're laughing. But if somebody looks at this and gets misled, and is writing their 200 point research paper on boilerplate, then yeah, that might not be so entertaining anymore. So, always making sure that what you're looking at is a real website. Um, pretty basic, but yeah, it's actually kind of important. And uh, so, aside from the entertainment value, why might someone create a host website? They got nothing better to do. <laughs> if you've got nothing better to do, that's right. You know, I don't care about going outside and taking a walk, or I've had enough of watching Keyboard Cat on YouTube. You know what? I'm going to make a hoax website, because that's what I do when I'm bored. Yeah, it could definitely be something um, entertaining you do when you're bored. But another thing is that if um, you're putting a hoax website out there to deliberately mislead people, then it could be that you have more of an agenda as well. So that's something more like uh, that, a, that a shady organization might do to try to spread biased information. So before you use information from a website in a school project, make sure that the website is reputable. And it's also worth checking out who made the website, what organization is behind it. A lot of times you'll go to a website and it might be sort of an offshoot of a larger company or group. If a web organization is unfamiliar, you try typing the name of the organization into a search engine and, sees what, and seeing what comes up. So if the organization gets a lot of controversial results or people saying things like, oh, so-and-so is distributing information that's untrue, or they're biased, they're politically extreme, things like that, then it would be probably biased to the source. The same trick works really well for web authors. If you find an interesting article on the web, then you can just type the author's name into a search engine, find what pops up, and whether they're um, a credible source, whether they have the knowledge necessary, the credentials necessary to be an expert. You could also type their name into, say, Amazon and see if they've written any books on the topic. That's a good thing to do. So the rule of thumb is to choose a good search engine and narrow your search. So. Let's say that you are writing um, a paper about the history of Paris, France. So I'm going to go to Google and search Paris. Now, when you search Paris, you get, um, you get Paris travel information, you get the Paris Convention Visitor's Office, you get a map, you, down here there will be Paris Hilton as well. So what should I do if I want to get more specific information that works better for my research paper? Advanced search. Advanced search. Awesome. So, um, where is advanced search? Oh, there we go. Thanks. So, I could search instead of just Paris, I could have Paris history. And I could, um, let's see, take English. And then I could also search within a site or domain. So site or domain, say youtube.com would be a site, or a domain would be .com, .org, .edu, .gov. What kind of domain do you think I should search in? 
couple of days, right like the president is reading your every tweet. And you might have to explain it to your friends why your tweets have suddenly become long, eloquent, and beautiful. But I think that it's worth it because it may not be the president who's going to read those tweets, but if your parents read those tweets, or if your teachers read those tweets, or if your future job interviewer reads those tweets, they will be very happy and probably impressed. So, act like the president is reading your tweets. What about blogs? How many of you have a blog? No. Nobody has a blog. So that's definitely if you want to have um, a digital footprint that includes more long form writing, that can be cool to set up. And if you don't want the entire world with creepy Russian gangsters and, and hackers and your parents to be reading your blog, you can always, on pretty much all the different blog platforms, you can set your blog privacy to private and then just let the people that you want to be able to read the blog. You can even have a private blog that's just for you. The thing to be aware of is that even if your blog, if you think nobody reads my blog, I can post whatever I want to on here, it's still traceable back to you. So unless you want to put something out there that uh, will, will be around for 100 years, then you probably don't want to post something that looks incriminating, um, any photos that, you know, don't make you look great. So back to the presentation. Um, so, we have Twitter, there's blogs, these are all ways of creating digital content. What are other ways of creating digital content? Have any of you ever made a YouTube video? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you've all made YouTube videos. Okay, so what do, what do you do in the videos? <laughs> Dance. Dance? Oh my goodness, I have some of those too. Um, my sister and I, we, we went through this phase in life where um, our idea of having a good time consisted of lip syncing to Britney Spears and have any of you heard the new Manuma song? Yeah. Yeah, yeah lip syncing to the new Manuma song. Bye. Okay, I really can't sing it. Uh, and Britney Spears and dancing around like we were crazy banshees. Now the bad thing is that we recorded every single one of those sessions and put them on um, YouTube and I think Facebook as well. And so now us dancing really crazily is out there everywhere. And my sister even has like hidden her channel now so that her friends can't go and dig it up and tease her about it. So when you make dancing videos, now I'm sure that you all are really like professional level dancers, so it shouldn't be a problem for you. But again, just keep in mind that 10 years from now, who will see this thing. Pri uh, making sure that you use privacy controls so that maybe it's, if it's unlisted that just your friends who actually want to see it can see it instead of, you know, creepy people who are like, hmm, I like the look of these people dancing. <laughs> Which, yeah, that voice in and of itself should really creep you out. So I know that you don't really have blog posts, but even on Twitter and Facebook, I know that you might say, well, 140 characters, isn't that an excuse for a little bad grammar, no, not really. Sure, you can abbreviate things, but I don't think that it's ever really that cool to be using horrible grammar, because at some point, it just becomes not understandable. If your writing is full of really sloppy grammar and lacks punctuation, then it's hard to read, it's hard to understand, and your writing represents who you are. Your digital footprint is who you are, and the writing that goes into that digital footprint is who you are. So. Try to check yourself off a little bit before you post something. Make sure you don't have run-on sentences, fragments, spelling errors, and that you correctly use words. Because every time I see one of my friends post something like, um, you know, getting where and were mixed up, and having multiple errors like that in the same sentence, um, then and than, stuff like that, I'm like, ah! Use spell check for spelling errors and make sure you're using the right form of the word. You know, the ones that sound like. Passive tense is an overused, varied sentence length, varied sentence structure, capitalization periods, titles, and italics. So, I know it seems like a lot of work to be basically going through the whole English teacher routine when you're posting something on Facebook, but it's worth it just to make sure that you don't annoy people. Think before you post, and if you post using your real name, make sure your post is something you want sitting around for a long time. If you have an online journal or profile, you can set your user settings to private, um, all fairly easy. Don't post incriminating photos or video. Your digital footprint includes more than what you say about yourself, it includes what other people say about you. 
Have any of you ever had an experience where someone has said something mean about you online? Yeah. yeah. I'm seeing some raised hands. Um, I definitely have. After my TED talk, the video got it got mostly likes on YouTube, but it also got a lot of dislikes. And some of the people who uh, really hated the video would post some kind of nasty things, not just about the content, but about me. And you know, sometimes there are people who will post things and they probably don't mean to be hurtful, but it can be hurtful. So like one of my videos, I I never really dress up, as you can tell. And someone posted, you know, if you had contacts instead of glasses, if you grew your hair out and you shaved your eyebrows, you would actually be really pretty. I don't think that was quite a compliment. <laughs> so, yeah, that, unfortunately, my digital footprint includes all the things that people have ever said about me. Now, the, your digital footprint, or things that people have said about you, is probably um, a little bit smaller, but it can still be really important. So something that someone says as a joke, for instance, could be seen as something serious. Um, how many of you have ever been kind of like fake mean to your friends online? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we've all done that and like, oh, you're so ugly, like, and then followed up with smiley face heart. But when your parents see something like that, it might take a really long explanation to say, no, I wasn't really calling my best friend ugly or stupid or whatever thing you were saying, it's just something that we do. The problem is that you don't want to have to explain your actions like that 10 years from now, 5 years from now. So it's just much easier to follow basic etiquette and basic netiquette, and then it's less likely to cause problems. People can't see that you're smiling when you're saying something mean online, even if you put that smiley face, or that when you're putting something in all caps lock that you really don't mean to be super angry and shouting. So what is basic netiquette? What are some of the rules you come up with to tell their people? Don't put all your personal information. Don't put all your personal information, definitely. Okay, so I'm going to start um, writing these up. Don't put all your personal information. And what else? Okay, don't don't have like air. 